So my name's Will. I've been around Protocol Labs for a while. This talk is looking at the things that are happening with car files. Um, and this is sort of an interesting intersection between data transports and file formats. We've, we've had uh, sort of an evolving role of CAR, content addressed archives, over the last several years, where it's taking on um, some new roles and being seen as a, a viable solution for a, a range of things, where previously some of that was a block store of how you would keep data around in a permanent way, and then uh, you know, cars came in as a way to export and re-import data. Um, but then we've also started to see cars as a viable transport mechanism as well. And they're starting to play uh, a broader role in data transport. And so there's a whole new set of constraints that are coming in. And that's leading to some further evolution uh, of car files. So I'm going to go through uh, sort of three different sections here. We're going to talk about the car file format uh, as a refresher. We're going to look at what's been happening around um, a couple different IPFS implementations in terms of using uh, car files uh, for data transport. Uh, and then we'll talk about sort of the stuff that's still up in the air that's getting worked on uh, as that continues. Car files. Uh, car stands for content archive, or content addressed archive, or whatever you want with a C and an A and an R. Um, it mirrors in many ways a tar file. Uh, if you look at sort of the structure and the design that goes into it. Um, this is a diagram that you can find on the IPLD.io website. But essentially, we've got a fairly small header at the beginning. That's the orange bit on that slide, which just says this is a car file. That has an optional root of the DAG or the data that's put in there. Uh, and then after that, you just have a bunch of blocks. And the blocks are serialized as a You've our int of the length of the next thing, the SID or the hash of the data, and then the data itself, and then you just keep repeating that. And that's car v1. That's been around for a while. Um, it's easy enough to export in that format. It's easy enough to re-import in that format. Um, so, so we've got this, this great thing called a car. Um, we've had it for a little while. Subsequently, uh, around Filecoin era, we realized we were going to be storing large car files in Filecoin that were like 30 gigabytes. And if you had a 30 gigabyte archive of blocks that were all under two megabytes on disk, and then you were being asked to take one block of two megabytes and send it to someone, it was not the most efficient to either have to take all of that data and put it into a block store in order to get random access. Nor was it great to take the whole 30 gigs as you got a request and put it into a block store to find the two megs that you needed and send it. And in fact, you really wanted some sort of index to do a direct seek to that two megs of data so that you could efficiently send just that two megs of data back out. And so that led to uh, CAR v2. Uh, CAR v2 is a subsequent iteration of the file format that adds the ability to put an index at the end so that you can get more efficient random access reads over your car file. Um, it has a set of kind of weird nuances to handle backwards compatibility. Namely, uh, there's a pragma at the beginning that says, this is a car v2, it has nothing in it, close, so that old car v1 readers will close cleanly and not panic. And then it starts up again and says, here's all my blocks of a car v1. And then it puts an index. Uh, so CAR v2 knows how to handle this. CAR v1 exit cleanly and doesn't do something weird. Um, there's libraries for it. It's not too much worse than CAR v1. The, the main thing to think here is we added the ability to put an index at the end. We add also uh, in that sort of v2 header slash pragma metadata that, uh, that happens at the beginning, the ability to get some future uh, extensibility. So there's there were some... Uh, fields in there that were sort of said, well, we'll put some capability bits so that we've got an option to signal subsequent things if we need to. Um, and we've got a couple fields here that let us sort of indicate, you know, 
that there might actually be more things in this header so that we can extend this header so that we don't have to make a car v3 when we realize there's some other thing that we want in a car file format. Uh, like we did with car v1, for instance, where there was a single thing of version number, which turned out to not be enough to then extend things without uh, the car v1 readers that already were implementations crashing. Cool. Um, so that's a car file. Cars in motion. Uh, so, so you've got this thing that has some blocks, and then we decided, and this again came sort of out of Filecoin where you had these 30 gig car archives. People were just using HTTP to download the car archive and then restore it on some other person's computer because what they wanted was the exact same bytes that someone else was storing. And so rather than going into bit swap and sending those blocks individually, and making sure you tried to get them reordered in the same thing so that you got the same bytes at the other end, or doing that same operation with graph sync, if you just took the bytes in a car file and did an HTTP download, you would get the same bytes on the other side. And you didn't have to worry about actually understanding any of the semantics and making sure that you had the right depth forced ordering of your data or things of that nature. And so you could do a much simpler implementation through a direct copy. Um, and so we suddenly started to see that there were all of these HTTP servers starting up and the people who were doing data replication were just doing HTTP transfer of cars. At the same time, from the IPFS gateway with things like Saturn, we realized that as the IPFS gateway, you had this option between sending the picture of the monkey or the blocks with the SIDs that composed the picture of the monkey so that the client could verify that that data actually matched the root SID that it had requested. And so you could, if you were going to push the verification of the content that you were asking in a content addressable way to happen on the client and not on the gateway as a trusted gateway, you needed that metadata of how the data was chunked and the SIDs that composed that and the metadata SID of the file in order to actually do that full verification locally. And that starts to look a lot like the data that's held in a car archive of that file, right? That, 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 that there, there's not too much additional overhead, and if you were to car export your file, that's pretty close. You don't even really have to like, I don't know, squint too hard to say, yeah, that's what I would like to have transferred over the wire to then do my local verification of this, because that's what happens when a local IPFS imports that data, is it's doing exactly that operation that we would imagine wanting a smart browser client to do. And so these two things led to saying, can we take and extend what an IPFS gateway is to have a trustless mode where we send something that looks a lot like a car, and in fact, let's just make it a car v1. And great. So, so what does that actually mean in practice? Well, I get a file on an IPFS gateway, ipfs.txt slash ipfs slash baffy yada, 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 gives you a file. This is a, a slightly compressed thing of what's in that uh, IPIP that says the format we're gonna use is you can just say format equals car, or you can use a content uh, header or an accept header to say that you would like to accept a car as your file format. Uh, and then we've got a couple parameters that we found useful in how you request things uh, that, that you can use to scope the data that you're getting back. And so those two parameters, one is your DAG scope, um, and that is saying, I want this direct hash, please. And that looks a whole lot like a raw request that already was supported. You can say, I would like this entity, which is a weird thing that gets used a lot in practice, but is kind of messy and is essentially saying, I would like this folder, but not all of the files in the folder. And so it has UnixFS semantics, which are a different layer of the spec, um, but is useful in practice. And then all, which is, I would like this whole DAG, keep recursing on links, give me, give me all of this as a car. Okay. And then the second one was, web browsers keep asking for range requests because someone seeks the movie to halfway through and the browser knows sort of how to deal with a movie and actually ask for a gigabyte into that movie, it would be great if we can get the subset of the blocks in the underlying file to efficiently render the movie from halfway through 
And the server actually knows how to do that pretty well. We have, with IPLD, enough knowledge of offsets of things to actually give you the relevant blocks based on an inbound, I want this subset of bytes. Uh, and so we have this entity bytes defined, again, with UnixFS semantics hidden in there in order to specify that you want a subset of a file. So those were the two knobs that seemed, in practice, relevant to serving gateway request traffic efficiently uh, that got encoded uh, in this. There's a subsequent uh, set of parameters that happened here as well, because, of course, people want more. Uh, so a subsequent IPIP 412 defines an ordering. Should these blocks be traversed in depth first search order or breadth first search order? So do you want your metadata at the beginning or do you want it interleaved as you need it? Uh, because different types of traversals wanted different orderings. And then secondly, if you run into the same block multiple times in this data, so it repeats the zeros a bunch because it's padded with a lot of zeros, should I be sending that block multiple times so that you as the client don't have to buffer anything and can do it in a purely streaming way? Or should I go for less data transfer, but the client is going to need to remember that there might be a block that's going to get referenced in a traversal that was sent way earlier in the traversal, and so you better have kept that around if you want to be rendering the file. Uh, so different uh, client sort of memories and buffer sizes leads to whether or not they would like duplicate blocks to be sent during that traversal or whether they don't want that. So that, these got added. The interesting thing about these is that they're getting sent in a different way than those query parameters in the previous part of the cars in motion. So rather than this being a thing where I set as a query parameter of I would like depth first, these now end up being a question of the ordering and the contents of blocks that come back in the car in a way that we want to differentiate them so that if they're, like, they're the same content in some sense, right? Like if I ask for a subset of bytes, that's a different car file. But if I say I, just, I want the same car file but just ordered differently, it has the same blocks in it. And in some sense, if you cached one that's a different ordering but it's the same blocks, should, you might want that still. Like it's maybe less efficient, but it's the same data inside of it. And so that that is cached is like a useful thing in some cases to differentiate on. So these were considered at two different levels of like differentiation of can this satisfy the cache versus is this a different thing? And so these actually go as preferences in the content type. Uh, and there's a two-way negotiation where the client, when it is saying what it accepts, says, I would like to accept a car with duplicates. And the server in its content type then responds, I'm going to send it to you with duplicates. And that two-way signaling in the query allows us to agree on these additional semantics or opt into duplication or a different ordering than default. So let's talk about the future. There's a few different uh, IPIPs that are in discussion. Uh, IPIP 431 is extending that same mechanism that got used for dupes to try and add the ability to send some metadata at the end of a car. There's two things that have come up there. Uh, and so you can see here that, uh, again, in your accept, you would say meta equals e of as part of your content type to agree on, I would like to send some e of metadata here. Or I would like to send at the e of, I may send some metadata. What is that metadata that you might want to send? You might want to send an error. Like I'm stopping your car partway through. In an HTTP world, there's no way to say why you stopped the car partway through if you both agree and the client now recognizes that it's going to get this little block of metadata at the end of the car transmission, that provides an opportunity for when something potentially stops partway through that you put this error JSON to say, hey, the reason I stopped was I couldn't find it in my block store. Um, it also allows uh, the ability for the server to sign uh, the response, uh, which is a thing that Spark is interested in in verifying the ability to retrieve data. The second one that's uh, happening is extending these traversals uh, with a way to skip raw blocks. Um, this is used to say, can I send just metadata, but not the actual block data? Uh, and so this provides sort of a scaffold that you can use in combination 
uh, with sort of direct raw downloads in order to re-piece together uh, content verifiability in efficient ways uh, that, that are hybrid. Uh, so both of these discussions are going on on IPFS specs. I think that's my 15 minutes. I hope you all are excited about a car future. Thank you. <laughs>